a balkanization of epistemology is taking place. And what I mean by that is there is no longer a commonality of understanding. I mean, for some people, quantum physics provides the answers. Their next door neighbor may look to the channeling of archangels with equal fervor. Uh, I mean, if this is not a balkanization of epistemology, uh, I don't know what it is. Uh, it is accompanied by a related phenomenon, which is technology or the historical momentum of things is creating such a bewildering social milieu that the monkey mind cannot find a simple story, a simple creation myth or, or redemption myth to lay over the crazy contradictory patchwork of profane techno consumerist post-Muslimist electronic pre-apocalyptic existence. on television. One of them was in America, the Sci-Fi Channel. The other was Sky One, which is a British broadcaster, an arm of News Corporation. And the shows were paid for by the two of them together, and they both decided that they were going to air the show. Sky decided it was going to air the show in October last year, and Sci-Fi Channel decided it was going to air it in January this year. January is a slow month for American television, so they figured they'd have less competition. Well, Sci-Fi had spent an entire year hyping up how great this show was going to be. Oh my God, the best thing ever. And the more they hyped it up, the more the audience got hungry for this program. And of course, you know, the average person who's watching the Sci-Fi channel is probably going to be a bit of a geek. Well, 
Sky One decided that they were going to start to show the episodes as soon as they popped out of the production shoot, and that happened in October. So in October 2004, the episodes were shown on Sky One. And guess what happened? People in England copied the episodes to their computers, they squeezed them down to nice, efficient files, and they put them up on the internet. No news there. People have been doing that for 10 years. What is news is the way they were doing it, because for the first time, they were using a new technology called BitTorrent to share the episodes. Let me explain to you how BitTorrent works. Let's say I have a book. It's a big book. But I've decided out of the goodness of my heart to give the book away to all of you. Okay, I have a book and I have a copy machine. Every one of you people in the audience wanted a copy of my book. I'd be spending a lot of time at my copy machine. Instead, what I'm going to do is something a little different. I'm going to take my copy machine and copy the first five pages of the book and give it to you, Sue. Next five pages and give it to you. Next five pages, next five pages, and on and on. By the end, I've copied the book once, and there are a lot of people who are all holding five pages of my book. And now I say to all of you, discuss because each of you have five pages. You don't all have the same five pages, but you all probably got a copy machine, and so you can copy the five pages you got and trade it with someone else who's got a different five pages, and all of a sudden there's just a whole clusterfuck going on and everyone's got a copy of my book. That's what BitTorrent does. Now, of course, Everyone's always screaming about piracy with BitTorrent. Revenge of the Sith was up on BitTorrent before the film had actually been released. Lots of TV shows are up on BitTorrent. Albums, all sorts of things that all sorts of record companies and movie companies are screaming about, oh, the piracy, oh, the danger. That's not the main point. The point is this. BitTorrent is more effective at getting information out there than any technology that's preceded it. It's more effective than broadcasting. Why? Because one person on one little computer with one slow internet link can publish something to absolutely everyone everywhere in the world. Because the lesson of BitTorrent is that the more people who want something, the easier it is for every successive one of them to get it. So what that means is that the age of mass media, the idea of centralized control over what you see, and what you hear, and how you come by it, is over. Now, they don't see it yet. It's all over for them. It's all whistling past the graveyard. All they see is theft. But there's something bigger going on here. Something that is really thrilling. Here's the thing. As all of us get creative, are creative, as we rip, mix, and share all of the things that we're doing with media, we're adding this to a commonwealth of things. There's more and more things that are meant to be shared from us to us, all out there. And all of this is also going on to the torrent. And what we're starting to see now are the rise of amateurs who are doing a better job at storytelling or documentary making or just producing something that's relevant and meaningful than any producer who's working for a mass market could ever. Because a mass market has to cater to a very broad taste. An amateur only has to satisfy himself and the circle of friends who will judge his work. So, here's the future in the present. You sit down. And because of BitTorrent, you don't have three channels, or 30 channels, or 300 channels, or 3,000 channels, or 30,000 channels, or 300,000 channels, and probably not even 3 million channels. You've got as many sources as there are people, most probably. And you sit down there, and you go, 
What do I want to experience? Well, there's this big production, which has got great production values, very pretty explosions. Or is this this thing that was made by this guy in Tennessee, which is speaking to what I am and who I am right now, this minute? And that's a decision that all of us will make all the time we sit in front of any media device. There'll be a choice between the big media production and this groundswell, this swarm of capabilities that are coming up from underneath for us. Because we're the audience here, but we're also the consumers, the creators, the contributors. It's all one. So, with BitTorrent, we now see an era where we've taught information how to swarm. We take a very simple idea, which is I can take something, duplicate bits of it, give it out over a wide area, and tell each of these bits that their job is to simply trade the bits they have with other people who have different bits until everyone's got all the bits. It's a very simple rule, it's a very simple idea, but it produces this emergent behavior that's now being called a swarm. So we now have the mechanism in our hands to give ourselves our own medium. We are all not going to be famous for 15 minutes in the future. We're all going to be TV stations. Okay, so there's no mass media making big productions because the audience for that is already eroding and will very soon go through this catastrophic collapse as 30 channels becomes 3 trillion. So what rises to replace it? Part two, a giant sucking sound. When I was writing the book before Hyper People, The Playful World, I was very lucky in that the Encyclopedia Britannica picked that moment in time to go live. So the Encyclopedia Britannica is the definitive reference work in the English language, 150,000 articles, and the article on relativity was written by Albert Einstein. Unparalleled quality, 250 years of concerted editorship. So when it went online, there was much rejoicing, briefly, because after 72 hours had gone by, there was such demand for the quality of facts on Britannica, it crashed. It was simply overloaded. It could not withstand the strain. So the folks who ran Britannica bought a whole bunch more machines, got even bigger, fatter internet pipes, brought it back up, and pretty much immediately they had one of the most popular sites on the internet because there's an incredible hunger for real facts, for things that aren't just sort of opinions, but real verifiable facts. People are hungry for this, and they flock to Britannica. And even though these folks were running one of the most popular sites on the entire internet, somehow, amazingly, they lost money at this. All right, now we think that the logic, particularly in a Google era, in a Yahoo era, is that viewers equal money. In television, viewers equal money. In Britannica, viewers mean losing money. All right, so what do they need to do? Because they're, they're hemorrhaging money. What are they going to do about this? Oh, we're going to create a walled garden. If you look for something on Britannica, we'll give you an abstract, but unless you pay us $6 a month, well, sorry, you're not gonna have all the facts. But of course you love our facts. It's po obvious, we're really popular, so you're gonna give us the $6, and they did this, and oh, some libraries subscribed, some schools, probably families with children who were in high school who could afford $6 a month. That was about it. It wasn't the explosion in usage they were expecting. Now, why? Because instead of that, instead of everyone signing up for Britannica, a different process set to work. So, a few years before this happened, someone had created a very nice technology for the web known as Wiki. Wiki is the Hawaiian word for quick. What does Wiki do? Wiki is a generic technology that allows you to have a web page that you can visit in your browser that you can edit fully from inside your browser. You don't need fancy software, you don't need fancy computers. It's all just going on inside the browser. So, 
someone back in 2001, on the 15th of January in 2001, took the wiki and put it together with the idea of an encyclopedia and created the Wikipedia. Now, it began with a kernel called Newpedia, and Newpedia was professionally researched, peer reviewed, but open source, meaning the content of the encyclopedia could be shared with anyone. Well, Wikipedia said, okay, yeah, fine, you guys are professionals, your articles are professionals. Guess what? Wikipedia is open to anyone. Anyone can edit an article, anyone can create an article. It's going to be a free for all. Have at it. So, when people used Wikipedia, certainly in very early days, and they found an error, they corrected it or not. When they did a search through Wikipedia to look for an article and a description of an article and they didn't find it, they created the article or not. But it was easy enough to create an article, it was open enough that on balance, Wikipedia slowly grew. And people found the articles and corrected them and added some articles. Somewhere, probably around September of 2002, there was an inflection point in Wikipedia, and Wikipedia started to grow exponentially. So by the beginning of 2004, 1,000 to 3,000 articles a day were being added to Wikipedia. And as of yesterday, 566,000 English language articles exist in Wikipedia. That's four times the number in Encyclopedia Britannica. So what happened? Why did that work? It's a simple act of seduction. So people use Wikipedia, certainly the few people who created it used it. They came to rely on it. They added to it, so they felt a sense of ownership with it. So, you use something, you rely on it, you feel like you have a sense of ownership with it. Well, what happens? Well, you tell your friends. Your friends check out Wikipedia, they use it, they come to rely on it. They add an article, they feel like they have a sense of ownership, and they tell their friends. And they use it and they come to rely, you know where I'm going with this. You don't have to go through very many steps very many degrees of separation before you've covered pretty much the whole planet. So, it's so many people using Wikipedia now all the time that it started to display a very interesting emergent behavior, something we couldn't have predicted. It's a knowledge swarm. So, with BitTorrent, we all trade the bits of information we already have, right? So that I have some that you've got, and you've got some that I've got. And this distributes the information extremely efficiently. It's little pieces that get shared to make the whole. But that's just data, that's just ones and zeros, it's just bits. Wikipedia deals with knowledge. Now, none of us are omniscient, but each of us has a little bit of knowledge, particularly in this room with my family, some of you have very interesting and very deep knowledge. You're all experts in something. Sasha Shulkin, for example, has forgotten organic chemistry in the last hour than I will ever learn. Katie knows more about game design. Mez knows more about search engines, and so on, and so on, and so on. But together, that's an enormous amount of expertise. An enormous amount. And Wikipedia is open to all of it. It seems really these days as if Wikipedia has got this gravitational force which is sucking all of the expertise out of every one of us on every subject and placing it into this seed which is on the verge of becoming what I can only call an Encyclopedia Humanica. Wikipedia is swarming human knowledge. It's doing that in precisely the same way that BitTorrent is swarming information. Whew. 
Now, you can actually see this swarm at work in real time. Let me tell you a little story. So I live in Sydney now. I moved there about 19 months ago. It's a Commonwealth country. We have the Queen on our money. That's how you can tell you're living in a Commonwealth country. And so I was watching with morbid fascination the royal civil wedding on the 9th of April when Charles was wedding Camilla. It was carried live on television in Australia, very big deal. They cut away from an astrologer talking about their charts to the live BBC broadcast of them going down to the guild hall to sign all the documents and get hitched. And I'm thinking, you know, I really don't know very much about Camilla. I should probably have a look at her page. So I type in Camilla Parker Bowles in Wikipedia and nothing comes. And I'm reading about, you know, how she actually tried to get Charles as a husband back in the 70s. It didn't work out, da da da, the storm and drong, the broken relationship, the whole thing. When it hits me, because Charles and Camilla have gone into the guild hall, that I'm on the right page at the right time, that I could update this page so that it no longer says Camilla Parker Bowles, but Camilla Duchess of Cornwall. And I'm like, yes! <laughs> It's, it's not a big deal, but it's a cool thing. All right, so I'm sitting there, and I'm waiting, and they're spending their time in the guild hall. God knows what's going on. They walk out. I hit reload, and someone's already done it. The knowledge swarm around Wikipedia is constantly at work. It's constantly creating something that we've never seen before. It's a collective factual record. And it's soon going to encompass absolutely everything we know about almost everything, whether it's trivial or absolutely vital to our species. That's a new thing. That's an amazing thing. But that's only the beginning. Now, an eye moment. Her name is Rio, and she's dancing on the sand. Just like the river flowing through the dusty land. And when she shines, she really shows you all you can. Oh, Rio, Rio, dance across the Rio Grande. Ah. My dirty little secret. I love my iPod. 5,736 songs. And those tell you more about me than anywhere else you probably care to look. And they're all here with me all the time. And I love it. So, within a few days of entering Podvana, I realized that I preferred my random, but not really random, soundtrack to the sound of the real world. I'd taken control of my ears, and I liked it. Now, that's something new. That's something just hinted at when the Walkman started popping up 25 years ago. And I remember the first time I saw someone with a Walkman. I remember seeing someone with those oh-so-tiny headphones. And I remember thinking, how fucking rude. How dare they? Now, the oral space, that's the space which creates place for us as a species. It's a common heritage, and it's a consensual reality. We share the common voice of man, not the common image. We are the voice. So, in retrospect, I realized that that anger and that indignation that I felt then was from the recognition that this person had cut themselves off, had subtracted themselves from the human community. They had unplugged themselves from the rest of us.
he had asserted the priority of his self, even if for only 30 minutes at a time. Now, that irritation was temporary. You know that within a year or two, I had my own headphones and I had my own Walkman, and I was in my own little self-created universe at 30 minutes aside. And the same thing happened to hundreds of millions of other people. But that was really just a taste of what was coming down the pipe. Now, let me tell you a little story that I remember from when I was 16 years old. I went to visit a friend of mine who lived way, way out in the woods, many miles from my house. Drove out there with a friend. We got to her house, which is really just a very large shack that her and her father lived in. And we walked into the main entrance, into the foyer, and she had us come through to the other side of the house. And there was a passageway that went from one side of the house to the other. And I looked at it, and on both sides of this passageway, which was about 20 feet long, about seven feet high, there were albums. And remember that big, black, thin things? Um, held music. And there were more albums in one space than I'd ever seen before, and I was completely just dumbstruck. I mean, more than even record stores, I think, had been in at that. I was like, Molly, my friend, What's this? She said, oh yeah, this is my father's collection. Don't get excited, they're all jazz. <laughs> Which is basically the point, because we were listening to a lot of punk music and new wave back then. But it was the first time I saw this entire sort of space of almost infinite choice, of infinite selection, of infinite variety. And on this, I have the 30 years of my life that I've been collecting music, or nearly 30 years of life. And it's with me everywhere I go. All right. Can you imagine anything more seductive than that? I pop on my headphones, I hit shuffle songs, and I'm in my own little world. Forever and ever and ever. So, I've started to wonder if I'm wandering around the streets of Sydney with my pod on and listening to something off the random. I'm humming some little pop song that I probably bought 25 years ago. I'm wondering if I'm just going to get wiped out by a bus that I'll never hear and I'll never see because I'm caught up in my own little world, in my little pod space. So oblivious, so blissful. And that writ large, is the shape of things to come. In this new swarming world, we command what we hear. We control what we see. Not in the hands of the mass media anymore. It's in our hands. And this isn't the matrix. This isn't virtual reality. This is the consumer electronics industry, a $100 billion a year entity, which seems as its fundamental intent, trying to exteriorize the human will into the human sensorium. That's what Sony's doing. It's what Apple's doing. It's what they're all doing. This is their function because this is where we, the audience, the public, are making them go. Whoa. If I block my ears, I can't hear. And if I cover my eyes, I can't see. Well, except for those ever more internal, ever more personal, ever more private reflections of myself. So, consider, we know that we are, in large part, a product of our own experience. So when we become the creators and consumers of our own experience, when everything is so finely tuned, when it's so personal that it's becoming irresistible to me and to you and to you and to you, where is the outside world that we have to assume exists? because more and more of our sensual space is being filled more and more with the objects of our desire. Where are the voices of others and where is the light in their eyes? And that, 
That's the darkness. That's the tunnel. And it's rising to envelop us even as I speak. And we're greeting it with joy. And I worry because although the self is the only reality we will truly know, there is another reality. But we're becoming the creatures of our own experience. And those experiences are coming to shape us. They're shaping us inside and out. They're becoming the ground and the reference points for being. And where's the space for you and all of that I, 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 I? So, as we bring our imaginations out, are they going to rip us apart? In becoming transhuman, which I did here on this stage, metaphorically, four years ago, I suppose that only a race of autistics could survive the transition to the transhuman. But not like this. Not like this. The danger here is that the common thread of experience which binds us all together in community because we share things in common, because we share the space of our ears, we share the space of our eyes. It makes it cohesive for us, a fabric of cohesiveness that this is simply unraveling right now. It's already happening, and it's happening in America first because America is the most mediated society on the planet. Listen, this red state versus blue state thing, what's that about? That's about media choice. You watch your media, it shapes you. It shapes your opinions. You vote. It's all about that. You can say, well, it's Fox News versus PBS. It's not that simple. It's an entire range of choices which become self-reinforcing views about how the world works. But the red versus blue thing is only the beginning, because that's just a bifurcation into this and that. We're bifurcating into that and 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 that. It's going to be the perfect war of all against all. Unless, unless, unless. So we are connected to one another. We choose to be connected to one another. We're connected by the bounds of trust, not by blood, not by money, not by means. The only constant in human relation is perfect trust. And the shape of that trust is utterly familiar to us. Think about that image again of me sitting at the family table and having a conversation with you over a cup of coffee. It's from the moment that we learn to talk, we engage people in conversations that essentially revolve around, can I trust what you're saying? Can I use it as a basis for me to understand and make my way into the world? Can I? Can I? Can I? We ask people we trust what is good. We tell people we trust what is bad. And it's been ever thus for at least 40,000 years. Now, with all of this blindness of our eyes and our ears, we must come back to the fact that the only new things, the only novelty that ever comes to us, comes to us through two sources. Either it's like a meteorite falling out of the sky. Those are rare. Or it's because someone else, someone we trust, has told us about something new, like the wheel or fire or the written word. We are who we are as a people, as a collective idea, because of we, what we share, because we share in perfect trust what we have found. So, hypothetically, the way out of this electronic autism is through the strong and constantly reinforcing connection to others in perfect trust. Because by ourselves, we inhabit a Bardo realm. It's only together that we can apprehend the world. Now, just two weeks ago, I would have said, that's it, I'm done. Wouldn't it be great if 
wouldn't it be great if we could have things like this? If there was a way that you could connect to the people you trust and share with them your moments of trust so that we could find a way that would keep us from falling prey to our own seductions into a mediated oblivion. We, we need such a thing, I would have said. We need it desperately and we need it now. I would have said that. In fact, I did say it just six weeks ago at another talk I gave about some of these same ideas to another group in another continent. But now, just within the last two weeks, we've seen not one, but two examples of the shape of the future. Now, these are just the beginning. They're really just barely even betas, but they tell us the shape, the other shape of things to come. Now, the first of these is very simple. It's called Outfoxed. It's a plugger, it's a browser plugin for, Outfo uh, for um, Firefox, the browser. All it does is it allows you to form a network of your friends, your social network, and you all share ratings of web pages. Do I trust this page? Do I trust this news site? And you can instantly understand how your peers are working in trust relationships with you. What do they find interesting? I want to find out what the best book is, what the best movie is, what the best TV show is. What do you do now? You ask your friends. Well, in a world with millions and millions and millions of media choices, where everything is possibly accessible basically instantaneously, how do you find your way through that? Well, you ask your friends. And so we're now starting to see tools that basically make the asking of the friends invisible, because your friends in their virtual selves and their digital selves are constantly connected and interconnected with you. And they're constantly sending you a stream of what they trust. You're constantly sending them a stream of what you trust. And in that trust network, you're together finding a way to navigate through this world. So that's how it foxed. Barely works now, but it does work. The other one is Icelopedia. It's a wireless application. It works on your mobile phone. You think, well, it's just Wikipedia for the cell phone. No, it's not. One of the things we need to do, one of the things that we need to have is a way to Google your friends. Not just Google the web, because the web's full of facts and figures, but your friends have some sense of understanding, because they've been there and they've done that, and they can tell you probably what's a good thing or a bad thing. And Icelopedia basically just allows you to fire a question off into the void with your mobile phone into your social network, and if someone answers, good on you. Eh, someone may not answer. If your social network is good, though, and if you use something like this long enough, you'll come to rely on it. Your friends will come to rely on it. They'll come to understand that the only way this is going to work is if they answer you when you ask a question, and if you answer them when they ask a question. And so this creates this mobile, instantaneous social network where you've basically leveraged the understanding. So now, now, where we are right now, we've gone from the swarming of information in BitTorrent to the swarming of knowledge in Wikipedia to the swarming of understanding. And it makes sense. It's perfectly logical that this is the order it would all happen in. This is the place that is opening up to us. And so, our perfect trust leads directly to perfect understanding. But even this is not enough, because our friends breathe the same air as ourselves. We're of like mind. That's one reason why we're friends. And they can't tell us everything we need to know. So we need to find a way to encourage irritants. We need to have them inside of us. We need to have them inside of our media. We need to have little bitchy voices which tell us that though we're kings for a day, all is dust. We need things to tell us that this isn't necessarily true, that there's another point of view. We need to have these things as tools that are part of us and also as friends we keep close to us. Because that's the bit of sand that becomes the pearl. It's the irritation that produces reality. And so, I give you a challenge here, some work for you to do. We have 200 years of mass media without developing any coherent strategies for maintaining self-consciousness before it. 
What we are is we're kind of like Morgan Spurlock in Super Size Me, where he did nothing but eat McDonald's for 30 days and basically nearly put himself in the hospital. Well, we think about fast food being bad for you and junk food being bad for you. But what about fast media and junk media? If you feed your mind with all of this stuff, what, it's, what is it going to look like? It's very simple. It's very clear. But we don't think in these terms. We kind of need an exercise program for the common mind. We need dietary guidelines for media. We need to develop an ecology of the common mind. We need it in order to survive, at least as a collective species. There's no choice. So that's the challenge in the closing years of history. This isn't a technological race to the eschaton. It's an understanding of how we communicate. Thank you. Thank you indeed, and I'm happy to say we have some time for questions, so please, up you come to those microphones. Oh, so now that I'm done, can I speak for a minute? The graphics, which were done by Chris Barnaby, who couldn't be with us because he fell in love very recently, um, uh, that you can buy the DVD. It's a $15 donation to Arrowwood, so if you like it, please, please, please go by the Arrowwood table and pick it up. I think he did an amazing work, and I want to thank Kevin Whitesides who's on, 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 on with me for his amazing work. He also produced the soundtrack that we're listening to. Now, I've got to tell you a story. We did this all. I live 5K from, uh, from Chris in Sydney, and Kevin lives in California. And all of this happened, and the resonances you're seeing in this work, they're basically accidental because we put together a very loose social network. We just communicated via email and maybe a little bit of web transfer data. And what I got out of this was this amazing piece of art. So thank you very much. Hey, Mark. Um, uh, talk to me a little bit about uh, the relationship between Terence's work uh, with the I Ching and novelty um, um, experiment and the end of the Mayan calendar and uh, where, you, uh, where you have a sense of all that. Uh, okay. Well, no, no, no. This is perfectly fair. Uh, we'll go off the, off the chart a little bit. Um, as near as I can tell, what I can make of this, what I can understand of this, I actually, let me go back to the root of Terence's work, which is Alfred North Whitehead. Uh, very few people have read uh, Whitehead's Process and Reality. Have you read Process? Yeah, yeah exactly. No, 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 it's a good one. It's a good one, exactly. Um, Process and Reality, however, a few people have read it and probably understood it, and Terence is probably one of those people. And so the core idea of Whitehead's is that there are these all, these are, there are waves of change, waves of novelty, and that novelty is a conserved value, like the, the total energy within a system, and that waves of novelty will cross each other into concrescence and produce more novelty. I'm pretty sure that when all of this is said and done, we'll understand that the fundamental, the initial waveform of novelty, the initial state, will bear some resemblance to the hexagram pattern of the I Ching. The hexagram pattern of the I Ching is simply a binary sequence that's repeated fractally over six levels of organization. So it's probably, it's not much of a stretch to think that that would be the case. Okay, next question. Um, I had another question, but I'd like to comment on the, uh, the time wave zero thing. Uh, to the best of my knowledge and to plant the seed of doubt, I talked with Dennis over email. Mm, I talk with Dennis ago. all the time. And uh, he let me know that they fudged it a little bit. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah absolutely. Um, back to your talk. Uh, you mentioned Wikipedia and uh, BitTorrent, and I'd also like to mention um, that there's Tribe, MySpace, Orkut, Friendster. Yeah, no, those are the formal social networks, and they suck, and let me tell you why. <laughs> All right? It's, it, it's, not, it's not their fault, and, but I'm doing my best to educate them. <clears throat> Um, a social network, so like MySpace or the Facebook or Wiki, um, not, not Wikipedia or Coot. And trust me, I had an experience, which I'm calling a web crack experience, which was when I joined up with Friendster, when I spent a week simply filling out my, my uh, first degree uh, connections in, in, um, in Friendster. For those of you who don't know, a digital social network is a place where you can establish a page about yourself, and then you can link to pages about your friends. What it does is it basically formalizes the idea of the six degrees of separation. So you can go from my, me to my friends 
to their friends and so on and so forth. So for instance, you can go to Eric Davis and then to someone that Eric knows that I don't know and so on and so on and so on. All right. Um, the problem with a digital social network is that the usage curve on it is basically, unless you're young and trying to get laid, which is the one exception here, um, because the Facebook is very active for precisely this reason, which college students use so they can get laid. Um, the usage curve for everyone that I've seen is basically like this. All right. It's wonderful and you fall in love with it and then it falls apart very quickly. The reason I believe is this. A social network is like a shark. It needs to move. It needs to constantly eat data about you to remain relevant. It's relevant, sort of, on the day that you've created the page, sort of, and as you make your connections. But the problem is that you have to constantly go there and maintain it and add things about it if you want it to be useful for you. And, you know, this is a busy, crazy, mixed up world. Who has time to sit in front of a web browser? Meanwhile, the entire world I'm passing through, thanks to mobile phones and credit cards, is producing a data shadow of, a data shadow of me, which you have to visualize like Jacob Marley's ghost. It's this great big thing of boxes and chains and all this stuff that's flowing up behind me. Well, my digital social network should be scavenging that information. It should be eating it and going yum and sharing that when relevant with my friends. My iPod should be listening to how often I listen to my songs and which ones I'm listening to and sharing that with my friends and so on and so forth. When Orkut and Friendster and all these people figure out that they aren't passive, but that they're dynamic. For instance, Google. What would happen if Google stopped its constant eating of the web? You would become dull, boring, imp unimportant. But Google is active. It's constantly out there eating things. That's what's got to happen with those social networks to make them not suck. Uh. Uh, how about a business network? About uh, two weeks ago, I received an email from a friend LinkedIn. of mine. Yeah. Uh, uh, a guy I know from a think tank that mm -hmm. I go to every year I've been going to. And, uh, uh, along with this, uh, with this system that he suggests that I plug into, comes mm -hmm. an endorsement. He says, I'm going to endorse you for right. this business link system. And I said, that sounds like a good idea. So uh, all of a sudden, uh, they're asking me to endorse other people as right. well. And Do you I know start, these people? Uh, well, people I know. Okay. People I know. And then I start to skirt the endorsements, and it's kind of like looking at the blurbs on the side of a book. You know, there are good blurbs, blurbs that have content in them, mm -hmm. blurbs that don't have content mm -hmm. in them. And so all of a sudden, I'm making connections between people who know people who know people who basically are interested in the same kind of thing that I am. Right. So this is a different type. This is not a social network. It's a business network. It is a social network, just, though. Wow. I mean, it's, 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 but, it's, it's, but it's got a reason. Which, which gives it an internal vitality, which is making it really relevant to you. Yes. I mean, that's why it's working for the college kids, because they've got a reason. <laughs> Same thing for you. Yeah. Indeed, I do. Great. That's absolutely. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that absolutely wonderful talk. Uh, I have a question for you about your observations uh, of transfer from different levels of a particular domain. The lower level you provided us was data. Right. Information. Information. Information may be a level above data. Then the level above that obviously is knowledge. The level above that is understanding. understanding. Right. And the level above that is wisdom. Yes. Can, can, you, can you describe your vision as to where this may go to help deliver us? Well, I mean, given, the, given that each of these things, if you plotted them out on a curve, would be falling sort of in an exponential, we might have gotten to wisdom sometime like an hour ago. I mean, at this point, it's hard, it's hard to know. Um, but th each of these things have relationships associated with them. Each of them sort of affects the others. The problem with wisdom is that is in, it's, can we quantify it, right? I mean, understanding has a relationship to wisdom, right? Um, is wisdom, can you define what wisdom is? Wisdom is, it's... Um, it's, uh, actu it's actualized. It's actualized understanding. So I, I, I'm not sure if we have the right tools to talk about it yet. But, you know, if you see it, please send me email because that's how I find everything. There's something wonderful about that phrase. I've developed a system which seems to bring trust to all types of transactions mm -hmm. and relationships in an organic fashion. Mm -hmm. It seems to address the issues that you raised regarding Friendster and the like. Mm -hmm. I brought it to some traditional venture capitalists and they've said that in theory the system could work, mm -hmm. but they haven't elected to back it. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what you would suggest doing to promote uh, Give it away. a system. Yes. Yes. Give it away. Um, 
in the modern era, the best thing that you can have, the best、um, thing that can happen to your work is for it to be stolen. All right. The more people who use it, the more valuable your work becomes, not the less. So therefore, if you do something and give it away, and you are—I mean, look at Bram Cohen, the originator of Bitcoin. He's given it all away. Look at Linus Torvalds, the man who gave away Linux. Many people worked on these. All right, your stock goes up. Social currency is the currency of the 21st century. There's tons of money. Who cares about money? If you give it away and it takes off, if it didn't take off. Yeah, five. If it takes off, the venture capitalists will become cock. All right, <laughs> they will, because they'll have what they'll, they'll want what you have, which is attention. Because attention is the, the currency of the 21st century. Social currency is sort of the thing that causes that attention to flow one way or another. Thank you. Yeah. I, I just wanted to comment on、uh, Wikipedia. Yeah.、Uh, I don't know how many people here are Wikipedians or use Wikipedia, but、uh, oh, let's like... see. Actually, a show of hands. How many people use Wikipedia semi-regularly? Woohoo! Okay.、Good. Well, you people should be shamed because the psychedelic section is pretty weak. Yeah. I, I started several pages just seated, but I don't have a lot of time to the, the, work on them myself. But. There's... There's... There's a person in this audience who I actually heckled into writing a nice page about Terence McKenna, <clears throat> mind you, because I, I knew he would actually do a better job than I would. But it, it is the same thing. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, with Arrowhead, you know, my.、Um, but I mean, th- there's the thing. You you should. It, it's there for us all to own. I mean, it's another story. The night that Schwarzenegger was elected governor of California was which two days before I left the country.、Um, I was editing his Wikipedia entry that night, and it was sort of slightly before the swarm. So I was actually it, it was up for a couple of weeks before someone actually replaced it with a more concise version than the one I'd done.、Um, I, I feel a sense of ownership over Wikipedia, and I know that's what. Makes makes me use it as a resource, but also makes me feel like I should tell other people about the resource. Right? Hi.、Um, I really like the idea of an exercise regime for the mind, and I think、uh, people have different ways of exercising. Some people do yoga. Some people jog. Some people do Zen. Some people do Zen. So I think you know, large number of people in this crowd probably have you know rigorous exercise programs、mm. in place in different ways for exercising the mind.、Mm. I'm wondering, you know. Is there a? Do you have any thoughts on sort of the the internal heckler program? You know how to institute yeah, that. Yeah,、um, Robert Anton Wilson has written about this brilliantly, and I mean one of the main things he said was to subscribe to several magazines that you hate. <laughs> All right.、Um, so I should probably go read the Free Republic every day, but I、uh, it, my blood pressure can't withstand it. I do read the Drudge Report. Okay, because that's probably just about as far over that line as I can go before an aneurysm happens. But, but I mean that—that's how you. I mean, in terms of red versus blue, you certainly have to think in the in those terms.、Um, I, we can see from what happened with Michael yesterday that people haven't necessarily been reading their skeptical works as deeply as they should be. That's. That's that. That's 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 that was sort of my impression. Is that you really do? I mean, part of that, I think, that system is, and and can we teach our children this? Can we teach our children? I mean, because that's really where it's got to start. In a world of infinite choices, you know, it's not just going to be the Disney Channel and Nickelodeon for them. It's going to be. Can we teach them how to feed themselves well? We may be the lost generation. You make me feel guilty here because I have exactly that. If I read a parapsychology journal now, 30 years of reading them and being, you know, I just can't bear it anymore. All right, I will go and read one for your sake. <laughs> <laughs> Or forty in times, maybe. At least it's fun. Well, that's fun. Right? right? I'll go that far. Yeah. First,、um, thank you for sharing with the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Which was what I said, by the way, in Hungarian <laughs> at the beginning of this.、Um, there's so much to talk about, so let me just、um, ask that maybe you、uh, reflect now on how、um, the elimination of scarcity、right. is changing the world in ways that it's never seen before and it's never understood, and that ultimately what I've seen as 
a way to see itself um, as itself mm -hmm. and you know it, this will save the world well scarce I mean the elimination of scarcity has its, it's not a panacea it has its own set of problems because we, we it now places a strong bottom a burden of responsibility on the individual to not become a glutton to in that sense to not uh, to, to treat perception in the same sense that you're treating the physical body, that, that, that part of the mind, and maybe this is a, this is a broken, it's a non-functioning mind-body dualism that we really need to look at very concretely, um, to be able to see where, once you come to an end of an era of scarcity, what happens? Do you just get so fat that your heart stops or your brain stops? I think that's part of the question we need to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, I, w I had two questions. One, I, I wanted to see, do you have any comments about the sort of emerging blogosphere? Oh, God, <laughs> wind me up, do you? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so Rupert Murdoch, who poo-pooed the internet five years ago at the height of the bubble, six months ago said that uh, the news media are in danger of becoming irrelevant. Now, the reason he said this is because of the blogosphere, and of course, every professional news organizations working as fast as they can to just basically all become bloggers. But the problem is there's, there's only like a few hundred of them against a gazillion. Who in this room doesn't have a blog going? Wow. Okay, so that's what, probably about 60% of the room? And the next, uh, Sasha, you have a blog going? I guess you just, you just collect them and they become the books, so it's all right. Um, uh, so when you're dealing with a media sphere where there's not a, sort of a hundred sources for news, but there's a, a million or ten million sources for news, this changes the individual's relationship to, the, to news. There's, t there's sort of two things going on here, and this is part of what I was talking to the Hungarians about, because the public news media in the rest of the world, not in America, because NPR is cushioned by a $100 million grant from Joan Crock, which was probably actually the worst thing that ever happened to NPR because it's insulating them from the turmoil in public media right now. Public media's role is to inform. Okay, well now that the public's sort of gone mad with this informing thing, what's their role? Well, clearly they have an outstanding role to handle the facts. But what we've now found about ourselves as the audience is that when it comes to opinion and commentary, we want to pick and choose. And so there's no implicit capability that the news media has to offer a comment that I'm going to be into. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my social network, my professional and, and personal social networks, to help determine where those com where, where, where in the blogosphere I'm going to pull from. So... <sighs> Yeah, it's all, I mean, the future is all based in these trust relationships because that's going to determine where we choose to focus our attention. And, and my, my second question um, that I had is, yeah, very, <laughs> it's kind of short, I wanted to see if you, um, you want to comment on what, what I, I really was uh, kind of really thought about what you're saying about trust and how this sort of you know, technology and the way it's evolving is pretty much we're going to be able to customize and totally get into our own personal reality bubble. I mean, I can already do that with my ears. Yeah. The eyes are not far behind. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's kind of brings about this sort of crisis where humanity is going to fragment into their own little personal fields. Right. And I, I, just, I just like to see also like uh, the sort of the disassociative effects of overstimulation and how and, and Susan was talking about how memes and how we can see these sort of modular aspects of reality and we can customize them stuff like that. And once we start kind of backing away and, you know, you know, what are we left with? And you're saying, well, trust, where does that trust come from? And like, I was kind of thinking there, there must be some sort of greater context for us to be living in, in order for that sort of, you know, humanity and technology to survive. Damn, good question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's no way to give a short answer to that one. Um, I, I, trust is emergent, I guess, right? Trust is based on a reciprocal nature of experience between at least two cooperating entities. It's not something, I don't, if I just met you on the street, the amount of trust I'm going to grant you is going to be vanishingly small. If I've known you for you know, 15 years, like Owen, oh, back out there somewhere, I trust almost every word that comes out of his mouth. So trust is a relationship. Trust is interactive. It emerges from in a series of interactions. It's not. Okay. Can I have this mic? Thank you. On, <laughs> Can I have this mic, please? 
Otherwise, I'm going to have to snuggle up to Mark and use his mic. Ah, there we go. <laughs> it's all right. No, don't get too close. <laughs> one, one of the... Oh, I've thrown his iPod away. No. Um, one of the most amazing things to me here is how it's possible for people so different to live in the same world and even be friends, may I dare say it? Mm. I never listen to music unless I can help it. I don't use my mobile phone except for emergencies and only three people know the number. And I've never looked at a blog in my life. But somehow, <laughs> we're all in this same amazing world. Um, before I thank Mark, uh, we'll just say we'll have a 35-minute break and then see you all back here. And a big hand to Mark for a brilliant talk. Thank you.